Welcome to the Cribble live stream. It's Ed Bailey from Cribble. I am the tech evangelist with Steve Colpin. Steve Colpin is a noted noted expert in machine learning. I've worked with Steve for years, working on solving just challenging data and observability challenges. And uh, one of the things that has just really come up over and over again lately is how AI and ML, particularly chat GPT, are in, it's just impacting the engineering landscape. So of course, Steve came to mind about, you know, let, let's let's get the low down here. And I reached out to Steve, and of course, Steve is knee deep in this already. Steve, can you introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. So first off, thanks for having me, Ed. So I'm Steve Colpin. I've been an engineer now for almost a decade and uh, solving complex problems through data and uh, use a lot of machine learning and starting to dive into this artificial intelligence now. And that's what we'll be talking about today is AI and using chat GPT. It's super exciting. So I'm not noted for organization, but I have created some organization today. So we're gonna have a couple of a few topics. So I'll just like kind of go through these topics and let's kind of go back and forth about you tell me about the topics and we'll talk about the value. Mm -hmm. All right. So this is what we're going to be talking about today. So how to use AI and machine learning to help uh, help engineers in their daily daily uh, list of what they have to do or daily items that they have to do and how it can make engineers much more efficient. So the four topics that we're going to primarily be talking about is summarizing unfamiliar topics. So explain new concepts coming in. Technology is changing fast, so it's important to stay on top of new trends and New, new ways to solve hard problems. Next up. Yeah, I, I love this. I, I think uh, helping engineers learn new things fast is, is incredibly important. As you oh, mentioned, yeah. things are, everything's changing so fast. You know, engineers need help. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Next up, we'll be talking about getting better, faster results from scripts and queries. So using the AI to help you write queries and write different scripts. Next, we'll be talking about troubleshooting. So having your own personal assistant available to help you troubleshoot problems. And lastly, we'll talk about uh, evaluating tools and faster ways to understand who the players are and, and what you're trying to solve. I, these are all ideal. Um, as you know, we work together with Splunk, for example, and it's a huge issue with any kind of observability tool is getting users to write good queries mm -hmm. and having an assistant that any user can then reach out to to optimize queries. It just it helps scale your engineering team so much better because you're not spending time getting bogged down in every single user's issues mm -hmm. and scripts. I mean, better, you know, better, faster scripts. You, you can't beat that. Troubleshooting is another one. Troubleshooting is a discipline. And, and unfortunately, most of your troubleshooting is at 4 a.m. when things are going to hell. And having something that can bring that steadiness, that methodical, that, that help help backstop and bring a steady methodical approach is just, it's just, it's invaluable. Truly invaluable. All right, Steve, you want to share your desktop and let's, let's get started? Absolutely. Let me go ahead and take over. All right should be popping up now so as many of you probably hear this multiple times today can you see my screen all right here i'm adding it all right let's go ahead and uh, get started on topic number one summarizing complex topics so one of the new trends that have recently emerged lately was observability so the first question that we'll go ahead and ask it is can you explain observability and for you for those of you who may be unfamiliar with o11y that simply stands for 11 letters between the o and the y which uh, is kind of shorthand for observability so we're going to ask chat gp can you explain observability in 50 words or less Got a session there. Let me uh, go ahead and reload this. All right, let's try again. Can you explain in 50 words or less like I'm a child? That's awesome. Okay. Sure. Observability. Ollie stands for observability. It means being able to see and understand what's happening in a computer system 
like a robot or a website. It helps people who work on the system to find and fix complex problems so it can run smoothly. So now let, let's elaborate a bit more. Explain like I'm a highly technical engineer. And notice the persistence here as well. So I didn't have to re I didn't have to re-ask it the original question. Can you explain observability? It remembered that or it persisted what I asked it prior. And so I'm asking it to explain like I'm a highly technical engineer. And so I'm not going to read all of this, but just looking at the first sentence or two, Ollie or observability is a term that refers to the ability to understand the internal state of a distributed system by collecting, analyzing, and presenting metrics, traces, and logs. Pretty accurate. So yeah, I mean, I got to give it credit. Yeah, that's pretty good. And and if we were to grab that and paste it into Google, it's not it's not pulled from any direct source and just not repeating what it got, what it found on the internet. It's it's deducing this through logic and reason and describing what it is. So next up, let's go ahead and uh, add a little humor to it. So let's go ahead and, and let's have it explain. How about we do uh, Stone Cold Steve Austin? Those who may have grow, grew up in the uh, 80s or 90s familiar <laughs> with go. wrestling. Let's have, uh, let's have it explain it like, explain Ollie like Stone Cold Steve Austin. All right, listen up, folks. Ollie or observability is like having an x-ray vision for your computer systems, you know? The ability to see what's going on under the hood, so to speak. It's all about collection, analyzing, and displaying the metrics, traces, and logs for your systems. So pretty funny, pretty, pretty similar. How about explaining like Snoop Dogg? Yo, check it out. Observability, Ollie, is not like having the inside scoop on what's happening with your computer systems, dog. So pretty funny, <laughs> little humor here. Yeah. Um, yeah. So pretty impressive. What do you think about this, Ed? This is awesome. I love this. And it just it, it not only is just useful, but it's also I think it's a lot of fun. And just and I think think about down the road the ability to mimic uh, a well-known person the ability to try to mimic and what they say how they say it is only going to get better it's going to get increasingly hard to distinguish between the machines and people over time mm -hmm. couldn't agree more and this also is where the deep fakes come in it's going to get even more pervasive mm -hmm. and the, the big thing that I, i'm kind of seeing the trend where, where i th see things going is this is going to exponentially get better so we may be familiar with, uh, say, linear growth of, of different systems where I feel like this is going to get exponentially better over time. So even a year from now, we're going to see significantly improved capabilities from this. Oh, yeah. I, it's exciting. And I think that's the whole point about it. it's going to be able to learn and grow. And especially, I think, with Microsoft's recent investment, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to accelerate even more. Yep. Absolutely. Think about, think about all the different ways you could use this. I mean, let's think about just in our narrow area in tech and IT, um, AI support assistance. So you have a user, something's not working, they're able to go, because we've all seen the chat bots and user assisted systems, and then generally they kind of suck. And mm -hmm. so if a user can say, hey, I can't get on the VPN, and then have intuitive, detailed information coming out from something like ChatGPT to help the user get through the VPN issues without having to engage a real person is a, is a real scalable, valuable, a valuable piece of assistance. Mm -hmm. And what we were talking about with Splunk queries, observability queries, uh, even SQL, it's something that everyone struggles with. You know, you, you want people to use data systems, but training users on how to query, query data systems and get good results is not easy. It's a huge drain on, on your, on your engineering teams. So mm -hmm. this is a way to, to scale, augment your engineering teams and help your users get better results from their data. Couldn't agree more. And that in of itself is a skill that takes a, a long time to long time to learn is writing good Splunk queries, writing good SQL queries, and kind of learning the language and how to make it efficient. So that kind of dives into the next topic here. So how can we use ChatGPT to write us, say, a Splunk query? 
So say if I'm a new user coming in, I've never heard of Splunk, but I'm placed into this job, and I, say as a security engineer, I need to get information, but I'm not really that familiar with Splunk. Luckily, I got ChatGPT available. So the next question I'm gonna ask it is, write me a Splunk query, which will look at our firewall data and show me the count between source IP and test IP by time. In addition, um, give me a one min span of time. Okay. Yep. And, and just for the uninitiated, that's a super common query. Um, I've watched um, firewall engineers struggle to to, to use these queries, to innovate in these queries for years. And so having having something that's going to help users, and this is something I hope to see in, in these sort of tools where you have a, a window that pops out where you can ask these kind of questions and you can get, and get these kind of results. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And time and time again, being on the Splunk team, we always get questions of how do I write this query? Why isn't this query working? Very simple query. Obviously, you may have a different index than just firewall. Easy to sub out and replace it. But for the most part, it's using the bucket command. It's binning by time with one minute spans. It's then doing a stats count by source IP, desk IP, and time. And it's got that one minute, uh, one minute span, and it's clearly explaining what it's doing. Pretty impressive. This is great. This is great. And, and the thing is, it doesn't have to be something super complicated or something perfect this just be able to help users with common queries and, and get better results because you and i both seen it where you, you'll have a firewall firewall engineer say index equals firewall and then have an ip and that's it and then yep. they wonder why it takes you know hours to run the query because it's just a it's a terrible query mm -hmm. exactly so I'm we sure may be database admins can sympathize with this too yeah indeed and one thing that you just brought up there, Ed, was it could be extremely slow. So a lot of you who are familiar with looking at firewall data, it is very large and it's high velocity. So how can we do this a bit more efficiently than just looking at all of our firewall data? So let's go ahead and see if we can speed this thing up. So how can I accelerate this search? And notice how I'm not referencing the actual search by giving an example of what the search is. It's persisting the, the conversation that we're having. And so it's giving me some examples now on how to increase that, the, the speed of that search. So it's recommending that I use index fields, um, optimizing the search string, using the earliest and latest to try to be as explicit as possible, using the limit command, summary indexing, good strategy, uh, probably the answer I was looking for here was using acceleration. It, number seven is a no go. I mean, this is something we need to be able to give give uh, ChatPT feedback of. Uh, no, exactly. Great, great catch there, Ed. So, <laughs> yeah, there it, it is still a little clunky in some use cases to where oh, this yeah. is a big no no, especially in firewall data. I wish my Alexa would be able to persist a conversation <laughs> like this. That would be nice. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. So. Pretty cool, pretty cool in what it can do, but clearly there's still a few bugs that I personally think will be worked out over the next couple of months as this thing starts to evolve more. Yeah, I, I think the, the level of investment in open AI, like just what we just mentioned with Microsoft, also just the more users and more people who bang on it, the more people who add data is gonna exponentially grow it. I'm just, I'm, I'm curious about the resources to support this. I mean, that's just, it's, it's going to get interesting fast. And of course, the competitors, I mean, you look at this, is this Microsoft's attempt to displace Google long term? And of course, Google already owns phenomenal compute resources and data resources, data scientists. And so I think this, this is going to lead to just an enormous amount of competition, which is going to be really good long term. Oh, yeah. Couldn't agree more. Yeah, so moving on, now Now we just discovered that it can create queries for us. What about troubleshooting queries? So if a user is good enough or dangerous enough to create their own queries, right. can we have it troubleshoot queries? Let's call it a, just for good measure, but highly likely to be able to figure out what I'm talking about. So. 
We'll say index equals summary, source type equals stash, stats, span equals 1h, max count by time. Now, while I load this, let me tell you what the two issues are in this query and see if ChatGPT can find it. So number one, we're using the stats with a span equals 1h. This is dedicated only to time charts, so it should be time charts span equals 1h, not stats. If we were to use stats and wanted to look at our spans of time, it should be bin. We want to bin our time with the stats command. Next up is we're doing a max count. We don't have a field defined as count already. So we're, we're doing max against a field that doesn't exist. Looking at what ChatGPT says, the field name count is not specified in max count, exactly what I just said. So make sure that the field name that you're trying to calculate the maximum value for exists in your data. Perfect, exactly as expected here. Next up, stacks, let's see, pretty much says what one, number one said. So not, not precisely what I was looking for. Well, yeah, not precisely what I was looking for. Let's see if we can get it to clarify a bit. So um, let's say. I guess it, it's really close. I mean, it identifies uh, something I see users do all the time. Mm -hmm. What about the span? The most common thing I see is users passing around queries. And and some one user will define a define a query with a field, and they'll try to reuse that same query in data, then, and they don't get a result because the field's not there. Mm -hmm. Bingo. Oh. And so, looking at this long explanation, let me just highlight uh, the important part here. So, however, it is worth noting that when you use the stats command with span argument, it performs a time based event grouping, and it doesn't group the events based on time, but instead uses the time values. So this case, it doesn't quite look like it caught that aspect of it. I've used different versions of this query before and it was able to pick it up. Looks like this case, it was not. So strike strike two against the chat GPT. It was close, it gave me a couple good suggestions. So right. like I said, it's, it's pretty good, but it's got a little bit of room for improvement though. One thing I'd be interested in is, I think a lot of companies want to use something like this, but they're not, you know, and I think this is something people should should understand. If you're taking a script that you wrote for your company and you put it in a chat BT, GPT, it's, your script has now become public domain. And so yeah. I think I think that those are things that people have to keep in mind when they're using this. Even though there's so much value, I think long term, there's going to have to be some way to shield chat GPT or shield the public, especially with engineers using proprietary information. Yep. Yep. That's a great point, Ed. So next up on the list, let's have it do some regex for us. So we got some sample data here. This is too cool. I mean, I'm just like, I, I just, I'm, I'm flabbergasted because I'm not good at regex. So having something that would help me write better regex, like, wow. Right. So what I'm asking it to do is create a regular expression, which will extract the value before the at sign and create the capture value with the name of name in the sample data below. All righty. Let me go ahead and copy that code and let's plug it in and see if it worked. Let's see. Yeah, that Flop looks pretty here. Cool. Let's uh let's see if we can get this thing to clean it up a bit. Oh. Uh let's see. We got to wait for it to finish. So it just went through an update yesterday. So it was working, that was working prior to that update. A couple things may have changed. So let's see if we can try to work the answer out of chat GPT. So let's say Create a regular expression for the sample data below. Extract the value before the at sign with a capture group called email. How about that? Oops. Grab that sample data.
Right, let's try that again. Ah, no, same, looks like it gave me the same regex. We'll try one more time, and if it can't get this, we'll move on. All right. So be a regular, uh, actually, I'm going to just have it persist. So that regex did not work. Give me a copy that will give me expression that will work correctly oh and that reminds me so is this a query language or is this natural language or what, what are the boundaries around how you can ask chat gpt questions yeah so this is using nlp or natural language processing and this is looking what I, what basically taking the input of what i'm giving it and it's comparing it so at a high level the way this is working is leveraging what they call the da vinci model so there's a few different models that you can play with in the playground uh, the Da Vinci model being the best one available. They have the Ada uh, model. They have, uh, I can't remember what the other one's called. I think it's the, Cut the Cutta model. I think it's the other one. They're all pretty good, but the you're going to have the most success in the Da Vinci model. One thing to keep in mind with the Da Vinci model is it was trained on all data all the way up until I think 2019 or 2020, something around there. So it doesn't have any context of... Uh, it doesn't have any context post that, but if we think of how chat GPT works, it was trained on the context of language. So it has the ability to logic and reason and deduce uh, different outcomes based off types of questions that you ask it. All right, let's try this again. There we go. Nice. So it lo looks like that regular expression did work. A little, could have been a little better, but it's not too bad. Sure. Um, give me one moment. I need to plug my laptop in. Well, Steve, step it away. Really appreciate everyone's time. It's so exciting to take take a look at what's going on, and, and just and everyone's talking about Chat GPT. So we just want to kind of go go in depth about what we can do, about what we can do, what makes sense, and, and practical use cases for you know everyday engineers and architects. All right. Got it. Okay, I'm back. There we go. Yep. So a lot of people could could definitely leverage this custom regex builder too. So I've used it in a lot of scenarios, and it, it's pretty good. Uh, you like I said from the previous example, you may have to get it to try a few more times. But what was really cool about this is I told it that regex did not work. Give me an expression that will actually work, and it even apologized to me and gave me the correct expression. Nice with an explanation of what it's doing. Pretty cool. It's still, all right. it's, it is, think about it, so it's being trained to all the information up until 2019. It's a lot of information. It's oh, just, yeah. it's the, the compute capacity to do this is just, it's like, wow. Mm -hmm. Indeed. So what if we want to get a little more complex now? What if we wanted to move away from writing queries to writing scripts? So another powerful tool in its arsenal is uh, a lot of times, me personally on the job, I got to write scripts for to do certain things, uh, automation jobs to make my life easier down the road. So how can we leverage ChatGPT to write scripts for us? So let's go ahead and uh, create something really simple. Let's say a, a calculator in Python. So if I need to write some logic, so write a calculator in the Python language. So this is going to create a script for me, which is going to uh, give me all of the, the logic needed to make this thing actually work. And after it creates that code for me, it's then going to give me a really detailed explanation of how it works. That way, I can make tweaks to it myself. It can make tweaks to it if I'm not happy with it or if I want to extend the functionality behind it. Best thing about this, this would take me quite a while to, to make. And it would take me also longer, I, in my opinion, to try to find the code on Google as opposed to just asking ChatGP to make it for me custom. And if we walk through it, it looks like uh, what we have looks pretty good. And, and looking at the explanation here, it, I'm not going to read this in, in its entirety, but 
Um, if we wanted to elaborate more, explain more on how this script works. This is going to give me a super detailed explanation to, as to what's happening. It talks about loops. It gives me uh, uh, the different uh, functions it's creating. And so super cool on how this thing can really make your life easier with creating scripts, writing code, troubleshooting code, uh, making it more efficient, uh, refactoring your code. Uh, it can do a really impressive things. Yeah, and I agree with you. I think especially it doesn't necessarily have to be correct, but if you have a quality starting point, I think that can help help bootstrap what you're doing a lot faster. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. All right. So moving on from this example now, we're going to dive into our next example now. And we're going to get on onto the example of troubleshooting. So one of the most common use cases that I'm always getting asked is, um, from a Splunk perspective at least, or why did my logs stop flowing? What happened to my log files? Why aren't they working? I get asked this question all the time. So now diving into the personal assistant uh, for, for aiding on your troubleshooting, really cool on some of the suggestions it can give. So if we were to ask it, why did my Splunk logs stop? Very generic. We probably need to elaborate a bit more, but we're going to ask it a super broad question just to see if we can get a um, some explanations as to why did my Splunk log stop. I, I can't tell you how many times it got pulled under a bridge saying Splunk's broken, and that's just like okay, you know, let, let's 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 dive down into what this could be. And I, I just think that I mean just. For the unskilled, the beginning user, there's a lot of value here, but also for highly technical experienced engineers, because maintaining your focus on the right things, being methodical, and I think that's something like ChatGPT could just could help drive so much value. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, good. I, I absolutely agree. And so it gives you and make it repeatable too. I mean, I think that yeah. repeatability is key because you you can you can't always have your best people on the phone. Exactly. You need your best engineers doing planned work and adding value, not troubleshooting problems. Exactly. So we look at what was given here, seven different bullet points. So indexer issues, forwarder issues, in con input configuration issues, and uh, et cetera. This one down here is probably the first thing I would do as an experienced engineer. Um, always look at your logs. What are your logs telling you? What's going on? Exactly. So let's see if we can have it elaborate a bit more. So how do you troubleshoot your logging system is to check your logs. Yep. That's the best way of going about it. So I'm going to say, how do I check the logs? What do I do? And so this is going to give me a few examples. Absolutely. Number one, you want to do check your monitoring console. Right. This tells you even how to get to your monitoring console. Next up. Command line interface. Go take a look on the uh, on the shell. See what's going on. Go tail your file. What file do I tail? Uh, let's see. Did it tell us to look at Splunk D? That's the one in particular that we're looking for an answer here. There it is. This is the location of our Splunk D file, which is our Splunk home, op Splunk, bar log Splunk, Splunk D log. That's the and one we're that, looking for. And that's the key place to start, too. So what if I don't have shell access? How can I look at splunkd.log in the UI? Almost getting it right. Needs to be looking mm -hmm. at underscore internal, though. It's not telling Indeed. people that, yeah. That's precisely what I'm trying to get from it right now. Yep. Because that's always that's always the key thing. That if you have the right access, you know, you may not know that. There we go. Not as explicit as I'd like it to be. So it's kind of going in the right direction here, but 
Right. Ideally, so what I'm looking for... Can, can you give chat GPT feedback and say, you know, you need to do this, this, and this? Yeah, oh, yeah. That's exactly what they're looking for. So right now, chat, chat GPT is in uh, what they call their beta phase. So mm -hmm. it's free. It's open. Everyone can use it. And they're primarily looking for feedback on how to make this better. So sure. down the road, it's going to cost money to use it. But luckily, oh, it's dirt cheap to use. So oh. I think uh, they, they use tokens based off price. So um, if we were to look at cost, it also depends on what type of model that you're using. So coming back to that DaVinci model that I spoke about prior, I think the right. cost for using the DaVinci model was something around like two tenths of a cent per, uh, I think, a thousand tokens which a thousand tokens is equivalent to around 750 word response back. So it costs you about a one fifth of a cent to get a 750 word response oh. back roughly. I mean, what a business model for something like this. It's just, you're, you're just hitting the cash register every second of every day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So let, let me give us some feedback now. So ideally I wanted to see the output include the source type equal to Splunky against the internal logs. So there's some feedback I'm giving it. Does it help to give it something like index equals underscore internal or something like that? Yeah, it understands it. It, it knows where to look okay. from. It's just being a little goofy right now and acting up. So I had to kind of lead it that direction. So. It's definitely not as good as an experienced engineer, but where where you can see a lot of benefits to this is if you start feeding it some of your knowledge. So clearly you can't, well, you shouldn't give it any type of internal sensitive information from your organization. Assuming if you could though, you can include some of that sensitive information, well, not sensitive, but some of that internal information into the uh, into the prompt that you're asking it, and it could go through it. And basically, you'd create like an if statement, or you'd feed it some examples, and then it can right. go through your logic and deduce the correct answer out of that. Totally, I, I think that's a big thing. As it evolves, I bet you there's going to be some way to constrain learned internal information. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, that that's definitely coming. So. Let's dive into our last topic here. So evaluating other tools and nice. kind of getting quick ideas of what's on the market. So as an architect, uh, we do a lot of work of evaluating new tools in the market, who the players are. Um, as a lot of you probably know, things are evolving very fast in the technical landscape. Um, so you got to be on top of your game. What, what, what tools are adding value? What tools can you do cheaper and more effectively? And how can you reduce some of that tool sprawl? So let's go ahead and see if we can ask how to get that done. So let's go ahead and say, what are the tools on the market today? It's be a long list. Oh yeah, Let, let's see if it'll give us, I, let's see if it'll give us like a top three, top five, or give us all. So Prometheus, number one, yep. gives me a little uh, description about it. Open source, Grafana, open source. I love how they include the description. Zipkin, Datadog. Interesting that Datadog is the first you know, first really commercial one. New Relic, yep. Splunk. What if we were to... Let's see. What if we were to slightly change this question to say, what are the observability pipeline tools that supplement a tool like Splunk? Or, data, or we can say, or say Datadog. Yep. All right, we got... Blue and D, pretty common one. Yeah, not really a pipeline, but yeah, whatever. Kafka, no. Yeah. There's one in particular that I'm looking for, and I'm trying to shake it out of it. I'd shake it out of yeah, GPT. 
Yeah, I have to change chat GPT. Yeah, what's going on here, chat GPT? Yeah, I know. What about Cribble? There you go. Adbot. And I can't, <laughs> <laughs> I can't, there we go. There can't go. Uh, put my new input until uh, this is finished. Okay, so they're calling it log streaming, not data, not not observability pipeline. That's why, because the DaVinci model uses data all the way up till 2019, so it's a bit stale. Yeah. There you go. If you if you spelled out observability pipeline, would it make a difference? Let's take a look. Or, or would it equate Ollie with observability? Yeah, it definitely equates the Ollie to observability. Let's see what let's see let's use their term, terminology of what Cribble was branded back in uh, prior to 2019. It was just Cribble, so, and, and it wasn't observability pipeline either. That that observability pipeline I think was 2020. Mm, that so was yeah, log data, yeah, log data streaming. That's exactly right. What are tools for log data streaming that are commercial? Do not include open source. Not log, you know, that's a sim. That's not log data streaming. It's, you know, analytics. Nope, not log data streaming either. Another bad bot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these are sims, not log data streaming. So oh, this man. is an example. It's, it's misclassified the data. Bad bot. <laughs> you make me sad. <laughs> Once That's it's awesome. done, once it's done with this response, let's go ahead and uh, see what it says. And it apologizes. I, I, I appreciate. It. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, you gotta love it. Mm -hmm. It's too funny. Yeah. So that. So, like we said, there, there's no magic bullet here. It, it's very good in what it can do. It's still got a little bit ways to go, but in terms of assisting, troubleshooting, explaining concepts, writing code, fixing queries, um, it, it's pretty impressive in terms of where it is now. I'm thinking in the coming years, we're gonna see rapid expansion, a lot more use cases coming online. Uh, we're gonna see much higher sophistication specifically around uh, how much data just is gen being generated uh, year over year. It's just exploding. So more data that's available for this thing to learn on, the better it's gonna get. And I, I really think the biggest takeaway here is you can't rely on this thing to replace humans or engineers or architects doing their job. This is a, a, a supplement as to how to make engineers better, how to extend functionality, how to increase efficiency of engineers. This needs to be thought of as using it in a top-down way rather than bottom-up top down in terms of give me examples as give me a starting point give me uh give me some examples to work from rather than build this for me implement it and then i don't have to do anything can't think of yeah. it that way yeah i, I totally agree I, I think in terms of supplementing there's a lot of tools here especially in the it side support level one support uh, troubleshooting. I mean, there's just, there, there are so many good use cases. So this is something maybe not ready right now, but it will be soon. Mm -hmm. I just, you, you, we've both been on too many bridges where I think having this thing is focused instead of having a, you know, an incident commander may not necessarily understand what to do. I think chat GPT could be a good incident commander about stepping through the process, stepping through the steps, follow up. I mean, there, there's, 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 there's a lot of good things here. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Well, Steve, I really appreciate it. Let's have just a quick summation, just just, uh, just as a follow up. So mm -hmm. I'm gonna go ahead and 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 take it take off the live stream. Let's go ahead and put mm -hmm. just our you know. So we talked about summarizing unfamiliar topics. Great, 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 great way to learn. Better, faster results from scripts, scripts and queries. Troubleshooting assistance. Faster new tool evaluation. I think there's just there's great stuff here. So mm -hmm. I really appreciate it. So tell me what. What do you think the future is going to hold for chat for chat gpt and equivalent tools yeah so if you would have asked me this question a year from uh, a year ago i would have told you ai is 
far enough out to where we don't have to worry about it in terms of uh, some of the scarier capabilities. I feel like seeing seeing how this operates now, I see a lot of use cases. I, I do see a lot of nefarious actions that could be taken with it. Uh, luckily, ChatGPT is what they call ethical, well, to, to a certain extent, to where if you ask it to do specific things, if you want to have it write bad code for you, malicious code, it won't do it. So luckily for that aspect, there are some ethical boundaries in place for it. Um, thinking about just different future use cases inside companies, I think it's going to be great at advancing capabilities much faster than what would have happened without it. I think over the next couple of years, we're going to start seeing uh, really revolutionary ideas coming. So uh, more, more in the thought, more in the aspect of lowering your MTTR, finding incidents, reducing incidents at a much rapid, rapid speed. We're going to see more uptimes across companies. And I think from a security perspective, this is going to be a really good tool in the arsenal of uh, investigating uh, security incidents and also trying to keep your environment, uh, trying to keep the bad actors out of your environment. I think long term, I, I want to be able to see ChatGPT GPT interface with our tools in order to say, hey, it's like, hey, I'm, I'm doing this, you know, run this query for me in the background, give me the results. And I think those are the kind of things I think that could be really, really helpful in the you know, engineering and architecture side. Yep, absolutely. This is really cool. Steve, I want to thank you for your time. Really appreciate it. We're going to have you back on the live stream really soon. Right on. Hey, thanks for having me, Ed. All right, take care. All righty. Thank you. Bye.